question. My life clock. Retrogram complete. Proceed 03303. But, but am I still Red Six? But I had four more years. I will get them back, won't I? You will take the object Ankh with you for identification. Question. Do I get my four years back? Adrenaline heads, I'm Jerry. And I'm Mark. And today's Adrenaline Cinema, we are covering Logan's run from 1976. Yeah. And, and this is a good one. Yeah. Now, now, since I picked this one, Mark said, hey, you take the reins. Yep. Yep. So I'm the guest on my own podcast. So I yep. figured, hey, let's give Jerry the, uh, the reins and be the host this time. So it's going to be fun. I like being a guest. <laughs> yeah. Less work that way? Yeah, exactly. So uh, with that, uh, I'll give out the synopsis of the particular movie. So we'll try to do this as a brief one because the one that Jerry originally had was like like two paragraphs long. And he goes, no, we're going to do the initial synopsis of what you get in the very beginning of the movie. And with that, you get sometime in the 23rd century, the survivors of war overpopulation and pollution are living in a great doomed city sealed away from the forgotten world outside here in an ecological balanced world mankind lives only for pleasure freed by the servo mechanisms which provide everything but there's just one catch life must end at 30 unless reborn in the fiery ritual of carousel hmm Yep, that's the way of the world these days. <laughs> At least in this world. Yeah, in that particular okay. world. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thankfully not here. So because yeah. we both would have been gone a long time ago. Yep. Okay, so let's go to people we may know in the film. Yeah. So I will mark uh, mark if you would begin. Sure. First one up would be Michael York playing Logan Five. With over a hundred and sixty credits, Cabaret, The Three Musketeers. Murder on the Orient Express, The Island of Dr. Moreau, which I remember him from, Romeo and Juliet, and well-known role in Austin Powers as Basil Exposition. <laughs> yeah, and I haven't seen that one in a while, but you know, Austin Powers may be due for a rewatch here. Yeah, it's pretty funny, too. I, I really enjoy the Austin Powers movies. Ah, uh, yes, and then we have... Uh, Jenny Gutter, who plays Jessica Six, and I first saw her in An American World from London, mm -hmm. and a movie that I loved, by the way, and recently done on Watched It in the 80s with Damien. Yep. And also The Railway Children, and then she starred again with Michael York in The Riddle of the Sands in 1979, and she's got a ton of other stuff out. Wow. And we see a lot of her in the movie, too, by the way. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then. <laughs> yeah, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to that later. Okay. Next up would be Richard Jordan playing Francis Seven. And we could see him in movies like Gettysburg, Raise the Titanic, which is five years before it was actually found, <laughs> Rooster Cogburn, Lawman in 1971, the Hunt for Red October, which we actually did cover here on uh, Adrenaline Cinema Podcast with Greg Schwamm. So that was pretty cool. Yep. Peter Ustinoff. Oh, wait. That's you. No, that's you. That's you. Oh, you can oh. do it. Peter Ustinoff, who plays the old man. And <laughs> in here it says, in a lot of movies since the 1940s, Spartacus uh, Quo Vadis. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Uh, I did. Uh, he's recognizable, his face, and he's probably mm -hmm. been all around Hollywood since the 40s. So, yes, it's one of those where you can't really narrow down every particular film because you'll be there forever. Yes, he's got a ton of, you know, uh, 
all the the four main leads have just have a ton of credits over the years. Yeah. Okay, and then in support we have uh, Roscoe Lee Brown who plays Box, and he has uh, when I looked at his uh, filmography, he has mostly t- TV credits, but he's one of those many uh, character actors that qualify as the quote unquote the guy that who is in that thing roles. <laughs> plays like a lot of judges, police chiefs, stuff like that. You know, just all over the place. Mostly, I've seen him played professors, but he's got one of those voices that I absolutely love. Yeah. Next up would be Farrah Fawcett Majors, who played Holly 13. Who doesn't know Farrah Fawcett? Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we also knew back then in the 70s, she played in Charlie's Angels. Also in the movie Cannibal Run, as well as the movie Extremities, which was very, very dark and strange in the early 80s. And finally, we have uh, Michael Anderson Jr., who plays Doc who is incidentally the son of the director and he's done mostly TV. And when I looked at his filmography, it's a lot of stuff I haven't heard of. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. And with that, we'll move on to general thoughts. Mark, what do you got? (laughs) Well, uh, my overall thoughts based upon this particular movie, uh, I I used to watch this movie when it was on TV within the early eighties, when it would be on in the afternoons Mm -hmm. on like a Saturday or Sunday, they would have like those Saturday or Sunday matinee movies or something. Now, mind you, this was done in 1976, so by the early 80s, it was kind of like one of those movies they just threw on TV, but it was edited down. It wasn't until about like maybe five years ago that I bought it on Blu-ray and never realized that a PG movie had so much full nudity at that time. I'm like, oh my God, a friend of mine and I watched it and both, we both talked about it and... You know, he and I both went to uh, high school together. He was our, um, you know, uh, student body president. And we just had a fun time talking about it as we watched it together. And he was just like, dude, this movie can never be made now with all the amount of nudity and everything that's going on in it as being a PG film. Yeah, it would be extremely difficult to keep it PG, but it would have to be an R. Yeah, definitely an R. And the movie, honestly, in my opinion, o- overall holds up based upon the premise of a controlling society and people rebelling and running for their lives. Mm-hmm. And uh, the visuals, in my opinion, were really great. And I love the story about a person who is part of the system, who is turned and changes things for himself because his eyes are opened up and mm-hmm. he finds somebody who he cares about. And it just kind of reminded me a little bit of Minority Report with Tom Cruise in some respect. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Okay. And my take is that we have a 1970s classic science fiction telling of a world that is kind of what we'd like to believe it's perfect on its face, but has a sinister and unseen cloud hanging over it. And, you know, that being what happens, you know, what happens to the people and they just think it's normal. Hmm. And I also love uh, the take on what would be called the future in 70s filmmaking. Mm-hmm. And this is like um, like when we when we covered uh, Planet of the Apes, it's just a lot of analog computers yes. that are supposed to be <laughs> today's digital computers. Yeah, very almost like with even with like THX 1138, <laughs> it's very similar. They have those buttons and everything else. Yeah. Even the robot, if you look at it in the movie too, at the very end when we get mm-hmm. a good glimpse of him. Very, very much, very costumey. Yeah, but yeah, you know, but that's all that they had to work with back then. Yeah, because you have to do a take on the future, but you have to use the contemporary technology. Yeah, I I agree with that completely. Yeah, yeah, and and I believe like some of the shots that they do are beautifully done. There are some glass uh, matte plat- plate shots, and I'll point those out when we get to it when we review the scenes. And to that, uh, what we'll go move to the favorite scenes in the movie. So, Mark, you want to start us off? Sure. My first scene, well, I think you probably have the same thing mm-hmm. for your first favorite, probably. But when Logan and stops and has to intercept the uh, the runner during the whole uh, renew Yeah, the party, first carousel. The first carousel itself. And, you know, and he deals with that with Francis as well. And in the very beginning of the film, we get to see the weird world that we're put in, how they monitor people. 
it gave mm-hmm. me vibes, like I said it before, of the Minority Report, because they got alerted. And it's pretty much of what we know now with social media, with, like, facial recognition. Because mm-hmm. they they had to do this, and apparently he changed his face when they got this guy at, at that point. Yeah, and, and yeah, because they, they scanned it, and they saw a different face on the scanner. Yep, and he was able to change his face. And the, show, the social commentary is pretty much basically to conform and deal with what the world is as it is now. And the higher ups are controlling the surplus population, as it were, that we do find out later on. Basically, they're ending people's lives to control the amount of people within that time, which is really yes. strange. They want zero population growth in this case. They have a certain number and they want to keep it at that. Exactly. Yeah. And now this one, I do, you know, the um, one one of my takeaways was they that Logan and Francis seem to take the light out of inflicting fear because they're shooting at the guy and they're laughing. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, that's just, you know. There, I you know, I know that you know you like your job, but do you have to like love it to the point where you're a crazy it? maniacal person? <laughs> exactly, yeah, that's a good way to put it. And one of the things about this one is that after you know they shoot him off the off the uh, second uh, off the balcony, mm-hmm. they they do the runner ready for cleanup, and they those guys come in and spray the body after the, you know after they take all the jewelry and stuff away, and he just disappears and too. Turns to mush, yeah, and disappears. Yeah, it, it's kind of easy to do that. Now, speaking of that, I, I love the visuals within the movie itself. So mm-hmm. with the first interactions with that particular runner, Logan and Francis are running through what looks like to be a mall that was repurposed. And I just love the visuals for it for its mm-hmm. time at that point, because it looked like a newer style mall. But mm-hmm. there was this one scene where, uh, with the overhang where he falls over, let's say, the balcony, as it were. Yeah. But there's, like, a, a section of AstroTurf that was there yeah. for grass yeah. at the second level, which I, I found very amusing. Yeah, well, I think you have to take what you can get when it comes to shooting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, um, and okay, let's go to your second point. My number four, as it were, instead of my number mm-hmm. five. That would be Logan and uh, what's her name? Jessica? Jessica, yeah, mm-hmm. and encountering the young ones within the 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 Never regions, how they are, they try to attack them and have no ability to defend themselves. They really are not really understanding of those worlds, mm-hmm. and they ha- all have not ventured up. Apparently, these uh, the these kids have never ventured up into the area where they're all kept. And Logan is still on the hunt for the runner at this point. Yeah, because yeah, because he gets a signal on the runner. This is um cathedral that you're talking about. Yeah, and they they get alerted about someone that should have you know be taken in at that point, but they they don't. But he himself, in his life pod state that he is at the end of his line. Yeah, he he's, you know, he's at that point. They already cut off those years, and he feels mm-hmm. betrayal if you think about it because yeah. they cut. Yeah, you know, he's got to die sooner. <laughs> it's like, what the mm-hmm. hell is going on here? He goes, wait a minute, I'm not even 30, but you're taking these off. But I have to still hunt for these people? Yes. And and it's away from, to, it's kind of like saying, hey, uh, yeah, you're going to have to hunt these people, but we're going to eradicate you regardless because <laughs> you know too much. Because he was questioning the computer in the yeah. very beginning of the movie about his job. And... The computer was just saying, yeah, you know what it is. (laughs) You know what it is. (laughs) And the fact that he meets a woman, he meets Jessica. I thought that was pretty cool. And then, but then Francis takes out these other people after seeing their interactions, Jessica and Logan and and their interactions with these people, that one woman that had information. And it was really sad. That was an interesting interaction within that, uh, that particular scene. But also the fact that, in my opinion, like with Jessica and and Logan, I think it was meant, it was kismet, it was something that they needed to be done, and that's what drives the whole movie. Yes. And my next point is at New U483, where we got the laser surgery machine that alters your face. <laughs> now this is, yeah, now this is the same, um, this is the same location where when Logan examined the first runner, this is the location where it was tagged to. That he said he he's gone to this place and did his face. 
Mm-hmm. Now, normally, you know, it's like you can get, you can change your face or whatever, but here they did it on what's called last day, or this is what Logan was investigate going to investigate, mm-hmm. or he got sent, you know, before this whole thing um, got kicked off. And he was going to go investigate this location because the runner, he was investigating whether it was going to be done on what they call last day, which is, again, you're just your very last day on Earth when you go to carousel. Mm-hmm. And when Holly is is the assistant and says, you know, he's there posing as a runner and says, give me dark hair. And he, Doc gets a call from somebody. I don't know who. I still can't pick up who called Doc and he said, yes, they're here. Hmm. And he starts to want to slice, you know, slice and dice Logan up with the lasers. Mm-hmm. He says, you know, when, because when they cut you and, and change whatever, there's instant healing that's applied before you feel any pain. Mm-hmm. And here he starts sending the lasers all crazy on him, And, you know, they ensue a fight and Logan puts doctor and he start doctor in the uh, on the table and he starts getting cut up by his own lasers. Yep, which is a very painful way to go. Seems it is like. a, well, they they were looking to do that to Logan himself. Yeah, and exactly. I th- I think the higher ups were doing that, mm-hmm. and it, it's probably a hidden scene or a deleted scene that we haven't seen before that was taken out of the film because I looked yeah. for it on the Blu-ray and I couldn't find it, but. Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool that it's like, oh, okay. So they're trying to, like, get rid of Logan at this point. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, Logan actually realizes it and makes it work for himself. So I, I thought that was pretty cool. That was an interesting scene, too. It was mm-hmm. very in-depth, too, with uh, Farrah Fawcett Majors at that point. Well, yes. she wasn't Farrah Fawcett Majors. She was just Farrah Fawcett. Yeah. Well, <laughs> at that point, I think she was... At that point, she was Farrah Fawcett Majors. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. She was married to... He was married to Lee Majors. Lee Majors at that point? Oh, okay. About six years, yeah. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, and let's go to your next point. Uh, my next point, that would be, well, uh, no, you, you already brought it up, the Farrah Fawcett cameo within the movie uh, with the whole new face scene. You know, it, it's literally reiterating, you know, when they're looking for people with a new face or new you as it were logan wants to run basically and try to alter his features and it just goes haphazardly so yeah everything gets all messed up and he doesn't get his face change he needs after all (laughs) that was my uh my number three on that and um my next one is when we meet box and seeing the sun for the first time and after logan and jessica escape from francis after he you know chases them down through you know what they call the love shop and through the um what i call the spear people you know mm-hmm. like the, the glowing spear people yeah that he got away from there but that was after he had signaled for help and this is when he was you know for some reason he signaled them and i don't know why he did because he was getting through okay so <laughs> so the yeah you know, and they show um the sandmen show up and start shooting everybody and when uh, we uh at during this scene meeting box he's like we find out that you know the runners who have gotten through mm-hmm. didn't kind of didn't make it through because <laughs> they ended up in box's freezer an unknown number of them so yep yep so basically it was the end of the line anyway yeah. and that's my number two as well uh is basically them meeting the robot called box and that whole encounter and he just basically freezes everybody that is a runner and it's him to like literally destroy it, but he just freezes them. He doesn't do anything more. He just he doesn't do away with them. But it's it, it's a way of getting rid of them from the regular society that they have just above. Yeah. And I thought that was really creepy too. But yeah, they were able to that, get away. Yeah. And on top of that too, that during that like when they first arrive, there was visuals in there like a throne almost like a chess set that was there that was all frozen. It was really weird and strange, the scenery, if I recall. Yeah, and there was a, uh, like, a sculpture of a walrus. Yes. Yeah. And then on top of that, it's like, Logan and Jessica have no problems with taking off all their clothes, and we see all this nudity, frontal and backside. And I'm like, wow, for a PG film, 
This is really good. <laughs> Logan didn't remove his pants, though. That's no, he didn't. It was mostly her that we saw, which I found very like, what the? And even during that uh, the party scene when they they're starting to walk through, everybody was naked and all that. I'm like, wow. This is something out of the 70s for sure. This is at the time when I guess ratings were very much different at that time. And I, I guess by the early 80s, they kind of uh, they, mm-hmm. they knocked it down where you don't have to do as much. And I'll go for my next point is sure. that after escaping, you know, after escaping this, they go through what we recognize as D.C. Mm-hmm. Washington, D.C., I should say. Yep. And. You see the Lincoln Memorial and the, you know what an old person looks like, and we get to see the ruins of the city, which is are some of these visuals that I really liked. Is that where you know I would have to find out where they actually got the the sets because these sets look practical. Yeah, they do. Yeah. A lot of the sets look practical throughout the the actual film itself. So I'm curious as to where they are and what mm-hmm. they have done with them. But a lot of the distance shots between, like, let's say the... Because uh, this is my number one as well. Uh, and I'm just going to say the uh, the sanctuary. Uh, we see the Washington Monument, not just the Lincoln Memorial. And right. we, we know that these are matte paintings in the background. And showing, like, overgrown greenery. You know, everything is starting to grow over everything. Even including the Lincoln Memorial itself. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, all the vines are all over everything. Yeah. And the fact that they, they have that one older person that they, they're working with, and they they knew nothing about a uh, husband and wife or mother or father. And right. they're asking him all these questions. And he's like, where did you come from? Exactly, yeah. yeah and, and one of that is, my other point on that one is, when they see him in the Senate chamber, this is where they also see cats for the first time. Mm-hmm. Other animals. Yeah, an animal. Well, animals of any kind. Yeah. Because there's no city. And the old man doesn't have a life clock on his palm like the like like uh, Logan and Jessica do. Mm-hmm. And he's like, uh, the old man's like, can I get one of these? I want one of these. <laughs> you don't want one of those, no. <laughs> Actually, no, you don't. <laughs> it's funny how the, um, the palm crystals that they have, mm-hmm. once you get to that point of like age 30 and it was a woman that wasn't even of 30 years of age, but they, they force it to turn red. That one woman, it's their way of controlling it. It was a way of, for them to control society. And then mm-hmm. obviously when it's not engaged, it's just like very light. It's just a regular mm-hmm. crystal. It's clear. Yeah, it's, it's clear. clear. Well, cause the, uh, when you see the newborns at the very beginning of the, very beginning of the movie, mm-hmm. the, the little the little palm crystals on their palms are clear. Yeah, you don't see green, you don't see yellow or anything. You, you would think oh, it's like it, it just go from clear to to red. <laughs> yes, you would think <laughs> they would actually have other colors involved, but apparently they didn't really think too much of this. <laughs> My last point. Uh, do you have one more point? No, I don't. Okay, and. Um... I had a couple more points, but I'll go ahead and skip over those and because they're going to get covered with um, like quotes. Mm-hmm. And the last one I have is when they get back to the city after they get back from Sanctuary, the computer in the interrogation of Logan does not accept that Sanctuary doesn't exist. Hmm. And, you know, we're not asking the computer to divide by zero, you know, and for some reason the place blows up. And it's kind of we- weird that the place would blow up that badly after the computer got told no, and it's contrary to your established fact. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, Captain Kirk can talk of computer death, but I didn't know that just telling a computer no in this world makes it blow up. So, exactly right. <laughs> that's one of my little sticking points about this movie. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, it's you know, you tell a computer no, it's not going to care. It doesn't care. No, <laughs> it's like a cat too. The cat doesn't care. It's going to do whatever it wants. <laughs> okay, and now that we're done with our with our scenes, uh, let's go on to interesting facts and unknown facts about the movie. Mark, you want to start off? Sure. The first one that you have here is the movie is based on a novel by William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. There were a number of changes from the book to the film, which Johnson and Nolan didn't like. Notably, the age changed from 21 to 30. 
mostly because the shock of dying at 21 as opposed to 30. The stage of the book was cut down from the entire world to just the area near the city. Yeah, because um, in the original novel, you know, people died at, uh, they were killing the people off at 21, and that was a much bigger shock than, say, living another nine years. Hmm. And and, and this one, it, it shows uh, they do have other hmm. colors, too. Yes. Yellow being birth to six, blue being seven to 13, red being 14 to 20, and red black on last day. And black at 21, according to the audio commentary. The movie changed it to 30 because it wasn't realistic to have a cast with all the characters under 21. It probably would have been costly at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because of the labor laws and everything. And now we do, the, we would have the young adult movies like, you know, Hunger Games and, you know, what was the other one? Divergence or mm -hmm. Divergent, I think the one it was called. Yeah. Okay, and go ahead and uh, do the in the movie one as well. Well, in the movie, with the passing of time, the crystal changes color. White from infancy to age 8, yellow from 9 to 15, green from 16 to 23, and red from 24 until last day, 10 days before one's 30th birthday. The crystal begins to blink red. Hmm. Which is what Logan had gotten done to him by the computer. Yeah. Yeah, it was forced <laughs> at that yeah, point. It was forced on him, yeah. Next point is Jerry Goldsmith did the score, and anytime I see a movie with his name in the credits, I know the music's going to be good. Yeah. Uh, including the opening sequence with you with the opening theme showing the scale of the city of domes and with the music expressing that. And there's other parts, uh, there's themes to the music where they have an electronic tone or character to the music inside the city and orchestral for outside the city. And mm. I don't know if you noticed that part. <laughs> I noticed that too, and I put that in my notes. I, I just love the um, the Moog and synthesizer music during the mm. runner pursuits. Yeah. I thought they were great in, in the very beginning, uh, but overall the music was great because it was a blend of New Age with synth, mm. but with what Jerry Goldsmith has done with the dramatic orchestral music for the scenes, I thought they were perfect. Yeah, and when it's like... Whenever I see, again, like, when you see him or, like, Hans Zimmer, you mm -hmm. know the music. So. Exactly. Okay, uh, go ahead and take the next point. Sure. Next up would be the wiring rigging for Carousel was specially designed so that both the upper and lower plates would turn at the same rate and each acrobat would be on their own set of rigging. Before the this redesign, the people in the wiring rigs got tangled with each other's wiring and had to wait until a forklift was brought up in to uh, extricate the players. The wiring can be seen during the sequences, but we can forgive that for the time that the movie was made. If this was remastered, the wiring would probably be removed by some computer work, which I do agree. But, you know, given the time that it was and we didn't have that, they would have to etch out or whatever all the wiring. They, they used to do that for Star Wars for, like, mm -hmm. with all the uh, fighter pilot shots and stuff like that. Right. Okay, and next point is um, the guns that the Sandman used worked uh, using tiny butane gas cartridges but were unreliable. And Michael York was quoted, like, those wretched guns misfired as much as they fired, and sometimes they wouldn't fire and a whole take would be ruined. <laughs> you imagine doing it perfectly you, you squeeze the trigger and nothing nothing <laughs> it's like yeah. i guess you just go pew 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 mm -hmm. <laughs> but now that you know now that wouldn't be a problem no 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 you just have to fake it and they just add it in later and in this age of you know in the age that this was shot in that they did practical effects for what they wanted and that i can see that nowadays being easily done with computers and cue lights on the guns but yeah all right, next one. Well, that would be, in this world, the family no longer exists. Babies are conceived by seed mothers, but are incubated and raised by computers. There are no last names, just numbers. No known relatives. When a child is incubated and born, a 30-year-old faces last day. Zero population growth has been attained. Meaning that uh, kind of like the TV show The Prisoner, you are not a number. Uh, uh, no, he would say, I am not a number. I'm a free man. 
But in that show, everybody within that prison ground was known as a number. This is mm -hmm. very much the same point. Yes. And I think it comes from the same thought because around that time, honestly, the prisoner series in England was around in the late sixties. So yeah. this is the mid seventies. So it's holding on to that same story point. Yeah. It's when it's, it's like that. Um, I call it that same generation of movies, like, you know, the six, late sixties into the early into the late seventies, those like 10 to 12 years, like uh planet of the apes had that. And yeah. you know, all, all those, that feel, there was kind of like a feel for the science fiction. Exactly. And kind of when star Wars came along, kind of changed things. So. Oh yeah. It changed the whole world as well as star Trek too. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Next point is uh, the Dallas Mercantile Center, which has since been demolished, and the Hyatt Regency, among other places in Dallas, were used for the indoors of the city. Hmm. And the retail space was used for the scenes with a crowd gathering for the carousel ritual. Now, when I did look this up, there's a huge that huge open space where they have the big lotus blossom on the wall. Yeah. And the people are kind of filing in. It looks like a like a theater entrance. Mm -hmm. That was done for like these shows that that for like fashion shows and other types of stuff. For that center. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And when I looked it up, it was like, that place is, that place is beautiful. And I saw some vintage commercials on YouTube for them, for this place. Hmm. Cool. And go ahead in the next one. The next one up would be the ice cave sequence was filmed in the middle of the summer in Los Angeles. The people that were frozen in ice were extra that were sprayed painted white. <laughs> The the extras had to stay still for minutes at a time. Wow. They they yeah. couldn't even have the decency of taking a picture and enlarging the picture and putting it behind something. <laughs> I guess it's just easier to spray paint a person and put them behind a piece of plastic. Exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. That's and, hilarious. And, yeah, and you could tell that, you know, in that scene in the ice cave, they you didn't see their breath from Logan or Jessica and you would have you should have seen something, you know? Yeah, yeah. They didn't really purposely freeze it. <laughs> well, yeah, and now, and I know for the thing they kept, they refrigerated the set on the set of the thing. Yeah, that we remember, yeah. To keep, yeah, to keep that authentic. Okay, uh, next uh, point is that the Fourth Worth water gardens were used for the final scenes where Jessica and Logan re-entered the city, leaving the old man to wait until they returned. Now, this one was is one of the composite shots that I really like because it shows that's where all the... Um, those concrete plates where the water where the water's trickling over. Yeah. Is that it they show it next to the ocean, but if you look it up in Fort Worth, it's like in the center downtown. Hmm. Cool. And so and you look at it, it's like that's one of those beautiful like I always I've always you know, especially about this movie, those beautiful composite shots that they have. And they have like one with inside the Senate chamber. Mm hmm You know, for that. And see so this one, see it's you know, they had to do, they wanted to show it next to the ocean, but since Fort Worth is very far from the Gulf of Mexico, they just used a glass plate, glass plate to make it appear to be on the shoreline. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, next one. Well, oddly enough, I know some of this already, but ironically, most of the cast was over 30 at the time of filming. Uh, Jenny Agutter, mm -hmm. is that the way you say her name? Yeah. Agutter was 23 and Farrah Fawcett was 29. Michael York was 33 and Richard Jordan was 38. Yusinov was way much older, <laughs> which That's I do funny. believe. Yes, because I think he was about 60 at the time, if I remember right. So. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so Jenny and Farrah would have been the only two that would have been okay in this world, but Farrah for not so much longer. Nope. <laughs> and definitely not for the uh, the mo the book version of it. Yeah. Okay. And um, this movie had several firsts. It used Dolby stereo on seventy millimeter prints, and in addition, York's head in the hologram sequence during the interrogation after his return from the outside was a first of its kind use. Yeah, because... I wanted to say something about that because that was very original for its time. Because mm -hmm. uh, yes. this is seventy six. This is before Tron at that point. So that kind of gave that um, holographic image. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it was using filming instead of uh, digital or computer-based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I looked at that a little bit more, too. And what they were originally wanting to use would have been far more expensive than the budget would have allowed. Hmm. So I think they resorted to like uh, 
to putting screens inside those inside those tubes. Mm-hmm. And but they were able to pull it off when they they were very successful at it. Yeah, and it, and it looked really good for its time. Okay, go ahead. Uh, next one uh, after the box office success, book author Nolan wrote two sequels: Logan's World, nineteen seventy seven, and Logan's Search in nineteen eighty as well as a novella, Logan's Return, published as an e-book. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. And uh, let's see here. Okay, and one of the points, I and I, I read this point, and I, the next point, and I had to find out um, if this was true or not, and I did take a look at the um, sequence where the crowd was gathered at the very end when they're gathering around the old man. One of the extras snuck in a, Vul- a Vulcan salute from Star Trek. <laughs> Did you see it? I saw it. Okay, cool. <laughs> one of the little things, it's like, you know, I love it when they do stuff like that in movies. Yeah, it's a little thing. It's like a little Easter egg in there itself. Or is this something that you have to look forward to? <laughs> and, um, yeah, I'll go ahead and read this next point here. So I, okay. The, the number of runners in the carousel sequence at the beginning of the movie... It was uh, counting, I counted 36 citizens renewing. Mm -hmm. Now, if all citizens are required to enter the carousel on their 30th birthday, and all birthdays are fairly distributed throughout the year, the number of people who, and the number of people who run is fairly small, the city's population would be about 400,000 people. Now, that's assuming they have a carousel every day. And I'm thinking they may have it once per week because every day seems kind of excessive. Hmm. And I ran the numbers on this, and if it, it's about once per week, it'll be about 55,000 uh, 55, people inside that city. Wow. Which is, you know, if we think about it, that if everybody had to leave the city and they had no computers to help maintain a genetic diversity, 55,000 seems like a, a big enough, is more than, I think, more than a big enough population to maintain genetic diversity. Hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's a small city nonetheless, though. Compared to like, what like we have person. now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, the next one up would be, well, since the mid-1990s, there have been several attempts to readapt the source novel with no success, including one announced by Warner Brothers in 1997, which it was rumored to be starring Leonardo DiCaprio and another iteration with Ryan Gosling a number of years ago as Logan. But as of September 2020, the project still resides in development limbo. Which is interesting. I I never knew that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I I checked several sources on that, and they seem to be saying the same thing. So that's the, you know, that's what I came up with. (laughs) All right, cool. Next point is the first choices for the roles of Logan and Jessica were John Voight and Lindsay Wagner. And the role of the old man was offered to James Cagney, who didn't accept because he was well into his retirement. Wow. And the character of Francis was originally supposed to be played by William Devane, but he withdrew at the last minute to be in a different movie, replacing Roy Finnis in a movie called Family Plot. And Richard Jordan came into the role and made it a very good one. And mm-hmm. although, you know, I, I read this and... I would have liked to just say, well, what what the differences would have been like when you, if you saw James Cagney in that role? Hmm. Be different. It would be very different. Yeah. Very different. Huh. Okay. Well, uh, Michael York suggested Farrah Fawcett to play Holly after meeting her at a friend's house. <laughs> That's pretty yeah, cool. I, I, yeah, I believe she was playing tennis at the time, and there's a thing, and Michael York said, "Hey, you might be a good actress." Well, <laughs> and she all she was at that time was a model, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay. Next to last point is Michael York told Hollywood Reporter in June 2021 that he initially had zero interest, recalling that he was in Los Angeles at the time, starring in a play called Ring Around the Moon at the Amundsen Theater. And one day that when the script arrived uh, with uh, from the director, Michael Anderson attached to direct. Uh, York wanted to work with the director again after their collaboration on a movie called Conduct Unbecoming in the previous year. But after one look at the script, he felt it was wrong for him and was prepared to pass. He said, I was so stupid, but fortunately there was a younger actor in the company who had been delegated to drive me from Beverly Hills to the theater and we became friends. He asked if he could read it. And I said, of course. Next morning, he turned up wagging a finger at me and saying, you've got to do this. You don't understand. It's pressing all my buttons. 
So he says, so I owe that actor a good deal. I went to MG- MGM and said, and suddenly I was doing it. Huh. <laughs> Pretty cool. Now, I, I read the actual article that was in, that was from. Oh, cool. Well, Logan's Run had a TV series spinoff from 1977 to 1978, and it lasted 14 episodes, but was canceled after the first season, with the last three episodes unaired. Sadly. <laughs> yeah, and I, I believe I sent those uh, episodes to you. Yeah, I got them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did you do all the counting within them? Because I really haven't. Did you Did you check the episodes to see if they added up to what they state? That's it was right, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, and now that we're done with our uh, points, uh, we'll go on to our quotes. Uh, go ahead and start, Mark. Well, uh, first one would be from Jessica stating, We've been outside. There's another world outside. We've seen it. And Logan goes, Life clocks are a lie. Carousel is a lie. There is no renewal. And that's at the very end, when they were trying to convince everybody. Yeah, and they're just getting laughed at. Okay, um, first one I have is when the computer assigns Logan to this uh, to this task of finding Sanctuary and Destroy it. It says, computer, you will find Sanctuary and Destroy. Logan says, question, what if I need help from another Sandman? Computer responds, negative. You will begin your assignment by becoming a runner seeking Sanctuary. Yep. Question, I'm only red six now. How can I pretend that I'm approaching last day? Computer tells him to identify. It changes his life clock and says, you know, retrogram complete, proceed on this mission. But and Logan responds, but am I still red six? I have four more years. <laughs> I get, them. I will get them back, won't I? And computer says, you will take the object Ankh with you for identification. And Logan questions, do I get my four years back? And the computer does not answer. Yep. Typical computer. <laughs> you know, which is which is kind of a terrifying thing. It's like you know you're you have multiple queries, and it's like just nah, I'm not going to answer. No, no, no. Yeah, basically, it's like yeah, you're dead. <laughs> yeah, like, well, it doesn't care. There's it no doesn't care. care. There's no caring. It's not human. <laughs> uh, last one for me would be uh, Jessica stating a friend of mine went on carousel. Now he's gone, and then Logan responds. Yes, well, I'm sure he was renewed. And Jessica just returns saying he was killed. Meaning mm-hmm. that she knew what the carousel was all along. Yeah. It's just a cremation machine. Mm-hmm. Next one I have, I have several more, and you can read some of these as well. When Logan and Jessica are headed to Cathedral to deal with the Cubs, mm-hmm. to go after that one runner he got uh, tagged with um, or tasked with uh, searching out. She says, you know, are the Cubs really as wild as they say? And you've never been there, have you? She says, of course not. Well, you wanted to come with me. You'll find out. They're wild, all right. They're the violent ones. There's no place else for them unless they change. And Jessica says, some people say it's all it's because they're born in breeders. Have you heard that? And Logan responds, we're all born in breeders, but most of us don't end up wild, running wild in cathedral. And this is the point. one of the points that I really like about this movie is that she says, no, but they say human mothering might be better. And says, I wish I'd known my mother. To which Logan scoffs and says, where do you get these crazy ideas? When did you first begin the question last day? And she says, I didn't say I questioned it. And then the uh, compu- you know, computer says they're approaching their target and kind of interrupts their conversation. Hmm. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. And so, yeah, go ahead and with the next point or next. Uh, well, the next one is with the spear people. It says, uh, no Sandman ever ran. You don't run. You kill runners. You have always killed runners. Logan says, yes, I have. But now it's my turn and I find what I want to live. Jessica returns, what's the matter with you? He's a runner. He's blinking. He must help anyone who asks, we must, or we're the same as they are deciding who lives and who dies. Which is a, an honest point. Yeah. But, and this is one one thing I said, you know, I, I like, even when I was younger and watched this movie, I think, because I think I watched it when I was 15 for the mm-hmm. first time. And I said, I kind of said out loud, it's like, yeah, now when it's your ass on the line, now it matters. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> he's not the one that's going out there and pulling the trigger or eliminating people. Yeah, zero empathy. Yeah, you zero. Know, until, until it matters to him. Yeah. 
a lot of that going around. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's life today, too. <laughs> this is one of my favorite scenes is when Box arrives. And I have to say it in, in his voice. He says, welcome, humans. I am ready for you. Fish, plankton, sea greens, and proteins from the sea. Fresh as harvest day. Overwhelming, am I not? Are you too startled? Am I too removed from your ken? And Logan asks him, what are you? It's like, I am more than machine or man. More than a fusion of the two. Which, I love that voice. <laughs> Definitely a strange creature. Yeah, and it's, you know, and the whole thing, you know, it's kind of terrifying because you, you just like, what the hell are you? You don't even, you know, you've never seen anything like that before. No, you haven't. But the the costume was very much for its time, very yeah. much the 70s of a robot yeah. for its time. Yeah, yeah just a kind of like a shiny foil, you know, shiny foil outer co- outer casing. Yeah, it reminded, it reminded me a little bit of like Battlestar Galactica. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, which we've seen some of those, like the shiny ones too. So. Yeah. Yeah. You want to go ahead and with the next point? Yeah. The next quote? Yeah, uh, the next one would be after escaping the ice cave or slash box and seeing the sun for the first time. Jessica goes, what is it? Logan's like, I don't know. Whatever it is, it's warm. Jessica states, we must be outside. <laughs> Because they've never known what outside was before. Very similar to like THX 1138. Because at the very end of that movie, you do see the survivor at that point. He reaches the outside and the the sun is blinding, the heat, the warmth, everything. The real world is very harsh. Yes. Um, Next quote is, when they are swimming in the water, she says, uh, Jessica says to Logan, says, look, look at your palm, the crystal, it's clear. What does that mean? And Logan responds, the life clocks have no power outside. We're free, hmm. which means that, you know, I would take it as they're reborn. Yeah, pretty much. Renewed. <laughs> renew, renew. Exactly. Next one up would be walking through a graveyard on the outside. Logan states, they've all got names and numbers on them. I wonder what they are. And Jessica states and reads... Beloved husband, beloved wife. I wonder what it means. So they knew nothing of what marriage meant at that they point. Have no they they have don't no have concept. a concept within that, within their world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because what's a husband, what's a wife? Yep. Nothing. Or, you know, and it's like, oh, child, uh, son or daughter or anything. You know, there's no sense of family. They're like mm-hmm. created out of Petri dishes or something. Exactly. Well, the seed, the seed mothers, but... Yeah, pretty much Petri dish. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and um, when they uh, are going to return to the city, Mm -hmm. Jessica states, we're going to go on, aren't we? Logan says, there's nothing to go on to. She says, there's sanctuary, there is. Logan states, you want there to be one, but that doesn't mean she interrupts. There has to be. I know it exists. It has to. And he states, no, it doesn't. Not really. Just so many people want it to exist. So many people who don't want to die, they want it, they want it so much that a place called sanctuary becomes real. But it doesn't exist. It never existed. Just the hope. And at this point, she's dang near screaming at him. It's like, you're wrong. It has to be there. Mm, yeah. Because what's the point of having that onk around your neck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And we didn't even tap into that, too. Yeah. Yeah, because... Uh, now, did you when you did research on this? Did you look at the Ankh and what it represents in uh, for Egyptian meaning? Oh, I did not. No, I did not. Okay, because it's funny because it shows that it's meant for freedom or something. Or okay. and uh, the funny thing about this is in the movie, it's really meant for runners, <laughs> which is so weird. And I thought it was funny. It's like, okay, so if you're free, you're a runner. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm thinking that because it's your, you get free. Uh, you have one here from the old man, and it's paraphrasing mm-hmm. T.S. Eliot's quote-unquote old possum's book of practical cats. The name mm-hmm. of cats is a difficult matter. It's not just one of your, your holiday games. You may think of, at first, I'm mad as a hatter when I tell you that each cat has got three different names. Mm-hmm. Whenever I read that, I hear Peter Ustinov in that same cadence he gives it. 
Huh. That's cool. When these get stuck in the head, you know, you know, I, it doesn't it doesn't go away for me. So. Huh. Okay. Um. Last quote I have is when they're walking on the beach towards the uh, the water entrance that they use. Mm-hmm. He says, "You mean to say that those people know ahead of time when they're going to die?" Logan says, "That's right." He says, "Oh, that's silly. What's the reason for that?" Logan says, "That's the way things are. The way they've always been." And the old man says, "Takes all the fun out of dying." <laughs> it does because they they know exactly when they're going to die. Mm-hmm. Okay, that finishes our quotes, and um, let's give our ratings for this movie, Mark. Well, I give it 8.5 out of 10 due to the age, but it's kind of a decently higher rating based upon the story itself, because I found it really interesting. Kind of redundant, it's been done before, but I thought Mm -hmm. this was done very well for its time, because this was 76, and I think it was a little ahead of its time for 1976. Especially with some of the effects, Mm -hmm. especially it being a PG film, too, of all things. This is long before Star Wars, if you think about it. Star Wars didn't come out until 77. Yeah. And same thing with Battlestar Galactica, all those other films. And then... Battlestar Galactica was 78, I believe. Yeah. And then on top of that, you know, you had other films that took... I already mentioned it with Minority Report and... Very mm-hmm. similar with society. The Island is another movie, too, that uh, kind of reflects mm-hmm. kind of these sort of thoughts or the uh, similarity within uh, the story itself. Okay. And uh, my rating, I gave it a nine. And I knocked it down just for a couple things. Like, there was a couple <laughs> editing things that didn't seem to make sense. Yeah. But, you know, I'll let those go. But But overall... I really like the movie, and it's one of those that I can put on, and I know exactly what's happening in the movie just by the sound of it. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, you could tell exactly what's going on just from the sound, or even the music too. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, music's a whole nother you know whole nother thing that we didn't get into, but it's just I'm glad it's Goldsmith. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it does make a it is a staple within the film too, mm-hmm. and if all your adrenal heads have not watched it, go out there and watch it. If you heard anything that you liked what we talked about, that that would be cool. Yes. Okay. And with that, we're going to move on to guilty pleasure movies. And these are any action movies that are not popular or great, but you just have to watch them every once in a while just because you love to watch them. <laughs> and Mark, what is yours? Uh, I've already kind of mentioned it. The the Island from 2005. So that's with Ewan McGregor and Scarlett Johansson before Scarlett Johansson became Black Widow. And mm-hmm. obviously Ewan McGregor has already been... Obi-Wan Kenobi. But this was a, a futuristic style of movie. Kind of has almost those modern style feels to it. But also mm-hmm. has the same thing, too. Because these people were put into a location and they had to wait to go to the island. Which was a gift. It was kind of like a lottery. Very similar to the carousel. Because the carousel, you get renewed with this. With the lottery, you get to be taken out of this refuge and brought to this island, but it was all a facade. It was all a ruse. Mm -hmm. And um, in that case, uh, my recommendation is check it out because these people were harvested to be parts for their real selves in the real world. So they, the people that paid for clones of themselves to be made and be put into this place called the island, or uh, not really the island, but wherever it was, I forget the name of the the, the place that they were brought to, but they were brought there to be harvested harvested for their parts. So uh, the original clients were thinking that they were paying for headless clones so they could take the parts if, like, let's say their kidney had went bad, their heart went bad, or they they needed a new blood or something like that. But these people, you know, the the celebrities or the people of wealth that created these things were duped and made to think that they're headless, but they're not. So the right. these uh, clones get out and are able to uh, get into the real world and expose the company for what it is. And uh, I thought it was a really good movie. And I yeah. thought it was pretty cool. You got Michael it- Clark Duncan in it, uh, Steve Buscemi. Uh, and a few others. I think um, Game of Thrones uh, Stark, who lost his head. I forget his name. Sean Bean. 
Yep, Sean Bean's in it. I suggest that. Check it out. Uh, I really liked it. Uh, it didn't really, over the years, It not many people liked it over the years, but to me, I still like, I, I mm -hmm. still enjoy it, watching it every once in a while. Especially for the fact that the the clones adapt or get memories of the person that they were cloned by. Or, you know, it's like Ewan McGregor's character, whose clone knows how to drive instinctively <laughs> and knows how to drive fast. And there's this uh, gimmick in it where it's like, oh, I don't know. He goes, you said you know how to drive. He goes, yeah, I know how to drive, but I don't know what the lights meant. Because <laughs> 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 it's typical, you know, with traffic. But yes. I, I, I thought it was a pretty cool movie and I highly recommend it. But uh, yeah. it really didn't get great reviews over the years since. Yeah, I, I liked it okay. You know, it's, it's not, you know, like I said, like I said, not the best movie out there. No. Nah. But, you know. It, it's good enough for a watch. It's entertaining, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, and I haven't seen it in a while, so I, I could put that on a list for a rewatch. So that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Now, mine is an obscure one. Oh, yeah. We have Vampire Circus from 1972. Now, this is one of the Hammer Films productions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and anybody who's, you know, who's has our, um, I was like, say film, you know, filmography watching mm -hmm. of like these old, you know, old obscure horror movies. Hammer, you know, Hammer is one of those names. Like you, you get all the Dracula movies, a lot of Christopher Lee starring in. Mm -hmm. But this one is about a village under quarantine visited by a traveling circus that is a little bit mysterious. And as the children in the village start disappearing, the locals in the circus troop might be hiding a secret. Hmm. Yeah. Now this one. Um, it has a couple familiar names. It has David Prowse in it. Oh, cool. Darth Vader himself. Darth Vader himself. And it also has um, a actress we will we'll know from Doctor Who. Her name is Lala Ward. Ooh, cool. And a couple other names. Uh, Thorley Walters. I know him more by my by visual. He's like always plays the dad. You know, the dad of one of the, the stars or main supporting stars. Mm -hmm. And another one was Adrian Corey. Was uh, was the um, one of the leads in this? Hmm. But it's one of those. It's like a really, you know, it, and it's available on YouTube for free. You know, so you can just put that on. It's like one I've watched every so often. It's always like if you're like wanting to watch something really, you're really off the wall. This is kind of off the wall because the um, the way they do these effects are like you know, uh, cut shot effects. I don't know if you you know, like um, they'll show somebody going up. Flipping in the air and then landing like being a panther or some other kind of obscure kind of a uh, acrobatic move. <laughs> yeah. But it's just that, that whole that old style that I really like. And when there's blood spill, that looks like it's like bright red latex paint. Hmm. Yeah, I got to check it, my old Hammer films because I have a whole Hammer collection mm -hmm. that I have on a hard drive because they're hard to come by. You could mm -hmm. you know, for the longest time you can only get them through if you go to a convention and people would have them they would record them straight from VHS to DVD and if not over time they would you know transfer that from like DVD mm -hmm. to MP4 format. But yeah. I have a hard drive and I think I have at least a good like 20 gigs worth of <laughs> Hammer Films yeah collection that uh I think it was like Hammer Films collection 1 and 2. So I have mm -hmm. to look at that, see if that's in there. Um, unfortunately, yeah. they're in storage, so yeah. <laughs> I'll have to wait a while for that. Yeah, and I do I do that with some movies I have too, you know, is that I'd rather just save them on digital and save my and save the, the hardware for later because it's, you know, I'd rather not risk damaging the discs I buy. Exactly. That does it for our Guilty Pleasure movies. So uh, where can we listen to you? Uh, have you been on anything else, Mark? <laughs> I think so. Uh, well, not for a while. Uh, you mm -hmm. could hear me on Panels to Pixels podcast, and that can be found on the Next Level Radio Online Podcast Network. And mm -hmm. uh, Steve and I cover anything comic book related that's been adapted to movie, TV, anime, cartoon, all that good stuff. And the last thing that we covered that was put out was What If on Disney Plus. When we do come back, I plan to cover Shang-Chi because I haven't been able to get out to the theaters to go see it or maybe the Eternals and then uh, cover those two at the same time. Just get a, a quick review of each and then uh, we'll move right along right into Hawkeye on Disney Plus. 
and nice. take care of that because uh, we're going to do that um, weekly as the episodes come out weekly on Disney Plus. So you can hear Steve Brown and I on that on Panels to Pixels podcast on the next level network. Nice. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. And I've been on uh, other episodes of Adrenaline, as the regular listeners of Adrenaline well know, and mm -hmm. as well as. Uh, now three episodes of Watched It in the 80s. We just recently covered An American Werewolf in London that was released for the Halloween broadcast. Yeah, so this is your fourth on Adrenaline, and you did, mm -hmm. what, uh, two or three so far with Watched It in the 80s. Yeah, I've done three with uh, three with Damien on, on that show. Cool. I hey, really and enjoyed that. The, the last one I really enjoyed, too. Uh, especially The American Werewolf in London. That was fun. Yes. All right, well, to submit your feedback, you could just submit your theories and feedback to our Facebook group, which would be facebook.com slash Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. You can also email us, and the easiest way is just Adrenaline Cinema Podcast at gmail.com. With that, you could easily just type out your, your thoughts and send that in an email form of whatever you want to send a reply to, what we covered, or what we are going to cover. You could easily just record yourself as well and attach that or put that as an attachment in the email and we'll play it. And that way you could be heard there as well verbally. We could be heard on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, TuneIn, or Deezer, Stitcher, whatever podcast player of choice. Obviously, you're hearing us, but... If ratings are available, please give us a rating or review on all those platforms if they're available. And we highly recommend that you suggest it to a friend because word of mouth actually gets us out there and people get to listen to us. So right now with Pyrocore Entertainment, we are currently looking to add to our Pyrocore family. So if you are a friend or a content creator and is interested in being involved with Pyrocore Entertainment, just please submit a sample of your work and just send that to piratecoreentertainment at gmail.com. That's pirate, capital P, core, C-O-R-P-S, entertainment at gmail.com. And uh, we're, we're not just looking for podcasters. We're also looking for video content creators or just regular artists, somebody who has a website that also wants to uh, contribute. So we, we want everybody to be part of this to be as far as artistic. And uh, as you can see on the website for Pyrocore Entertainment, it's not just the three podcasts, which would be Adrenaline Cinema Podcast, Run For Your Lives, or Watched It in the 80s, which we've already mentioned. We also have Kirk Manley, who does our artwork for the Pyrocore Entertainment Network. And you could check out his work as well and his links. And you could actually get in contact with him and he could um, do something on commission for you if you would like. I'm looking to get him to do the, uh, as soon as I settle down, I give it another two or three months until I actually am completely settled down. And that way we could have new artwork for Adrenaline Cinema Podcast, which would be awesome too. And then that way I could actually have more out there and do an Instagram and do a Twitter. And then that way we could get more listeners to be listening and more people to be interacting with. So with that, check us out. Go to the parkourentertainment.com site and check all that out for the other podcasts and content creators. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so basically uh, that's our little bit of information right there. Okay, and with that, we'll bring this podcast to a close. Mark, thank you for being a guest on your own show. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for taking control, sir. Oh, not a problem. That was fun. Yep. Glad to give you a break every now and then. Yeah. And with that, uh, I am Jerry. And I'm Mark. Thank you. And this was Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye.